everyone, John the Morgile here, checking in for another Flat Earth video for you. Hope you enjoy it. We're getting right into it, the Flat Earth Awakening is one that started for me personally in April of 2015 or thereabouts. At first, this whole Flat Earth thing appeared to be completely unbelievable, crazy and ridiculous conspiracy theory plucked straight from the ravings of a lunatic who clearly didn't know squat about science or astrophysics. And I couldn't believe that during our technological era, people would be so gullible as to believe that the Earth is flat. From my perspective, one of deep interest in theoretical physics, space travel, NASA, and astronomy throughout my life, it seemed like it would be easy to debunk this flat Earth nonsense and be on with my day. But some of the arguments for Flat Earth raised an eyebrow and actually made a lot of sense. Of course, I was still operating from the mindset that infinite space was a real thing. This is one of the biggest problems of coming to terms with the truth. That is to say, considering this topic from within the parameters of the infinite space paradigm. Just as everyone else, I had been profoundly misled about our place in the universe to the point where the concept of infinite space and the heliocentric solar system were ingrained into my understanding of nature. The very first piece of evidence which got me thinking that the Earth might actually not be a spinning ball was the fact that the horizon line continues to raise with the observer regardless of altitude. We've all seen the high altitude footage of the Curvison captured during, for example, the Red Bull Felix Baumgartner jump from space, where we can clearly see the curve of the Earth from about 100,000 foot. To the untrained eye, that would appear to be an open and shut case for the globe Earth. We can see the Earth's curvature from this vantage point, and so the Earth is obviously a globe. But when you realize that this is merely a trick of the camera, a fisheye lens which creates the illusion of a curved horizon, also known as curve eisen, it becomes clear that whomever was responsible for directing this shoot was being deceptive. When independent people send up their own high altitude balloons and cameras, we find that there is no such curvature to be found. And this begs the question, why, if there is Earth curvature, would high-profile stunt coordinators need to fake Earth curvature? Of course, this doesn't prove the Earth is flat. Uh, it does raise some red flags to the interested observer looking into the topic. If the Earth is in fact a sphere, there would be no need to fake Earth curvature. According to the Globe Earth Theory, the horizon line is a physical phenomenon which is caused by the rotund Earth vertically descending down and away from our vantage point. In reality, the horizon line is an optical phenomenon which is only subjective and is caused by the convergence of distant objects at the level of the observer's eye. In reality, the horizon is an optical phenomenon, or an illusion really. The apparent angular size of objects diminishes in direct proportion with the distance from the observer. So if you're standing two feet away from a telephone pole, it will essentially fill the entire vertical field of view. Uh, the same telephone pole a hundred feet away will only constitute a few degrees of your field of view. At a certain distance, the apparent angular size of the same telephone pole will be invisible to the naked eye, or it will be indistinguishable from everything else along the horizon or the vanishing point. The telephone pole will apparently shrink with distance, and the center point of that shrinking or squishing will always be aligned to your eye level. At a certain distance, the telephone pole will have converged with the horizon, which will also be at the level of your eye. Now, art classes typically teach an incorrect explanation of perspective or how to draw in perspective. It is often taught that in order to draw in perspective properly, you choose a vanishing point which acts as a reference point to which all parallel lines jutting out and away from the observer are aligned. This may appear to be an adequate rule of thumb when drawing in perspective, but as stated, it is incorrect. 
The problem lies with the fact that parallel lines running away from an observer's point of view only converge at the same point if they are equidistant from the center point of an observer's line of sight. For example, the lines comprising this brick wall will converge at various points depending on their distance from your line of sight. So, for example, the lines, say, six foot above and six foot below your line of sight will converge at a given point, whereas the lines that are a foot above and a foot below your line of sight will converge at a different point compared to the lines six foot above and below your line of sight. So the notion that the two sets of lines, one set is a foot above and a foot below your line of sight, the other set six foot above and six foot below your line of sight, uh, the notion that these two sets of lines will converge at the same point is erroneous this may sound confusing at first, but it is really quite simple once you understand it, and it can indeed be verified all over the place throughout nature. To put this point another way, parallel lines which run towards the horizon will converge with one another at a specific point, depending on their lateral distance away from your line of sight. So if you're in a hallway which is exactly square, say 15 foot wide, 15 foot tall, the floor, the ceiling, and the walls will all converge at the same point at a given distance away. If you were to then place uh, outlines of that hallway outside, overlaying it above, say, an ocean, and place new parallel lines, say, 50 foot askew from your line of sight, the new parallel lines would converge at a completely different distance than the original lines comprising the corners of the hallway that are only 15 foot askew from your line of sight. Uh, this principle of perspective can be verified by anyone who cares to study parallel lines in nature, which is to say it is a self-evident immutable law of how we observe nature. When observing vertically oriented objects, such as telephone poles or the masts of distant ships at sea, it's equally important to remember that the horizon line itself, comprised of earth or water below the line of sight and blue skies above, this horizon line will act as an obstruction to your line of sight, at least when it comes to objects that are sitting on the ground and vertically oriented jutting up above the horizon at a distance. So the waters comprising the bottom portion of the horizon are physically stopping the light coming from the lower portions of a distant ship, preventing that light from reaching your eye, and thus creating the illusion that the ship has gone over a curve. Refraction of light also plays heavily into this equation. Now, as such a distant ship continues gaining distance from you, the observer, the lower portion of the ship is obscured by the physical barrier comprised by the waters. While the ship continues to squish inward equally in all directions, with the center point being your line of sight, the horizon obscures your line of sight from observing the bottom portions of the ship, creating the illusion that the ship is traveling over a curve. When you're dealing with ships at sea, any waves or perturbances or undulation in the waters can and will create a sort of false horizon. If a wave of water is sitting on the horizon, say, three miles away, it can completely obscure a ship that is taller but is further away. Another example of this principle would be to take a quarter, say, in your hand, and obscure a very large distant object, say a car or a truck. Now we know that the quarter is not larger than the car or the truck, but the apparent angular size of the coin is in fact much larger than the distant car or truck. By this same token, a wave sitting close to the horizon a distance away can obscure the lower portions of a distant ship sitting near the horizon. So the ship hasn't actually gone over a curve, it is being obscured bottom first by the physical horizon line itself. Now this natural and immutable law of observation is exacerbated again by the refraction of light. It was long assumed historically that light must always travel in straight lines. 
In the 1600s, however, science finally acknowledged and understood the effect of light refraction, which is essentially the bending of light. Since we can only ever observe the world in perspective, and what we always see is light, light is shown to bend through the atmosphere plane and certainly does not always travel in rectilinear paths as assumed prior to the 1600s, the phenomenon of distant ships apparently dropping along a curved ocean is thus shown to be an optical illusion and in fact has nothing to do with Earth curvature whatsoever. With this principle in mind, it's no surprise that we see the tops of distant ships at sea apparently converging with the horizon at a later time or a further distance than the portion of the ship that is nearer to our line of sight or lower towards the water. The argument so often paraded around by the globe earth proponents involving ships over the horizon, mast last, somehow proving a globe earth is thus debunked. As a lifelong globe earther, I was often confounded by several problems with the standard theory of gravity, astronomy, and infinite space. One of the biggest problems that I never could seem to rectify was that of Polaris's centrality to all the other stars. In truth, the only reason we have any sort of foundation for the concept of geological axial rotation, as well as distant stars housed in an infinite space, is due to the rotation of stars around Polaris. The alleged alignment between Polaris and our alleged axis of rotation is claimed to be a chance coincidence, and according to theory, over time we will eventually have a new North Pole star. This is, of course, owing to the alleged hypothetical alignment between our axis of rotation and the distant star, some 325 light years away, and the phenomenon of axial precession. Now, we're told that the sheer distance to the stars prevents any noticeable parallax change in the apparent position of the stars. In other words, since we are supposedly traveling through space with the sun at nearly half a million miles an hour, as are all the other stars, allegedly in a similar motion, you would expect to see changes in the position of stars relative to one another. Since some stars are allegedly much closer than others, uh, the nearest star being about 4.2 light years, the furthest visible with the naked eye star allegedly some 16,000 light years, according to the standard theory. So with this in mind, you would expect to see major changes, albeit over long periods of time, in the relative position of the stars, since again we're supposedly moving through space and many of the stars are relatively close and many of the visible stars are allegedly many times further. So as we allegedly move through space, the stars nearest to us should change position more quickly through space compared to the stars that are much further away. Such stellar parallax would amount to major permanent changes in the relative positions of stars, thus we would not be able to map out constellations that would work for navigational purposes for thousands of years. The simple fact is, the constellation system, which appears to have been first mapped by the ancient Greeks during at least the first century BC, hasn't changed one bit over the 2,000 plus years since it was created. While the sheer size and distance to the stars may seem to be adequate to explain the lack of major stellar parallax over time, this argument becomes less and less feasible with each passing decade. Over thousands of years, there certainly should be permanent changes in the constellations, since the stars comprising the constellations are not claimed to be related to one another whatsoever, other than the fact that they appear in proximity to one another from our arbitrary vantage point. So in a single constellation, you might have one star that's supposedly 20 light years away, and another star in the same constellation that may be purported as 200 light years away. And you may have yet another star in the same constellation that is 2,000 light years away. In this sort of layout, you would never expect to see permanent proximity of these stars since, again, we're allegedly traveling through space with the sun, and the stars visible in the sky are supposedly flying through space at similar ludicrous speeds as well. The last thing you would expect to see are permanent clusters of stars which never change relative positions to one another. 
Now, aside from this major problem with the standard theory of space, we have an even bigger problem when it comes to Polaris, the North Pole star itself. This is due to the fact that Polaris is unique in the respect that all the other stars make daily circuits around it. It's claimed that this phenomenon is directly resultant from Polaris's near-perfect alignment to our alleged axis of rotation. Of course, if you consider the Ball Earth model, if you're facing north and observing Polaris at sunset, you'd be facing in the opposite direction towards space 12 hours later when observing Polaris just before sunrise. These two angles give us a triangle, with the equator or respective latitude line being the base of the triangle. If you map this observable data into 3D AutoCAD software, which is extremely accurate, it shows that Polaris is only a few hundred thousand miles above the Earth according to such triangulation data. This simply will not do when it comes to the Ball Earth theory, as Polaris is alleged to be quadrillions of miles away, not mere hundreds of thousands. As Polaris is proven by simple triangulation to be much closer than purported by theoretical astrophysics, even assuming a ball Earth, this is a huge problem for the standard theory. Furthermore, since the Earth is allegedly in motion, as is the Sun, you'd certainly not expect to see Polaris as central to all the other stars over the course of thousands of years. Again, this is because when you're facing towards Polaris, say at sunset, you have one leg of a triangle, and 12 hours later at sunrise, or just before sunrise, you'd be facing in sort of the opposite direction towards space, creating another leg of the triangle, and of course the equator, or whichever latitude line applies, would be the base of that triangle. So if you move the Earth millions of miles, as claimed by the Globe Earth Theory, it doesn't seem feasible that you would have this perfect triangulation on Polaris, which has never even budged a smidgen over thousands of years. But this is truly only the beginning of the problems with Polaris in the Ball Earth Theory. The Earth allegedly undergoes a 26,000 year wobble cycle. This means that the Earth's axis of rotation would necessarily be in constant flux and certainly couldn't point towards Polaris for thousands of years. This alleged wobble in the Earth's axis demands that we absolutely cannot have a stable or permanent North Star in perpetual alignment with our hypothetical axis of rotation. If the Earth's axis is wobbling through space along a long-term precession circle, the most obvious evidence for such axial precession would necessarily be found in whichever star is aligned to the axis. So, if Polaris is aligned to our axis right now, in 20 or 40 years from now, we should see a measurable, permanent change in the centrality of Polaris, as the alignment we have right now simply will be misaligned after a few decades of precession. The Earth's axis is claimed to be phasing through a 26,000 year wobble or precession cycle, which demands that our axis should never be aligned to a single star or a single point in space for longer than a couple of decades at the most. If the Earth is wobbling once every 26,000 years, as they claim, then we should see a single degree change in the alignment of our axis over 72 years, or a quarter of a degree in just 18 years. In truth, we have never seen any change in this alleged alignment between our axis and Polaris, meaning the ball Earth theory yet again fails to match observable reality. Uh, this argument is completely separate and independent of the concept of parallax, which is again explained away by the incomprehensible distance to the stars. Now, in this case, with the alignment of our axis towards Polaris, the further you place Polaris, the worse the problem becomes. So, the unimaginable distance to Polaris actually exacerbates the problem as opposed to apologizing for the issue. Now, this has to do with the alleged angle which our axis is pointed off into space. This angular alignment between the Earth's hypothetical axis and Polaris, some quadrillions of miles away, must necessarily be extremely precise. So again, the further you place Polaris, the more precise the alignment must be. 
By its nature, even such a sluggish transition in this axial alignment, again, that's one degree over 72 years, this sluggish transition would demand the night sky appear dramatically different from one century to the next. To test this claim, one need only begin a cursory study in alignments. If three points in space are aligned to one another, even a very slight motion of one or more of the points will necessarily result in the loss of this original alignment. This is another one of those self-evident, immutable laws of nature which must be completely ignored to continue one's belief in the ball earth theory. The ball earth theory demands that the world be in motion through the galaxy, zipping through the cosmos at some millions of miles per hour with the galactic frame of reference. At the same time, the sun is alleged to be making circuits around the center of the galaxy at nearly half a million miles an hour, while the earth makes circuits around the sun at nearly 70,000 miles per hour at a 60 degree angle to the sun's alleged path of travel. Furthermore, these alleged velocities would be following curved linear trajectories, which means that angular acceleration or centrifugal force would necessarily be present at all times and would be phasing through different angular relationships between the two orbital paths and would thus manifest itself perceivably to our senses, measurably to our tools of physics, and yet no evidence, no measurement has ever been taken of this alleged motion around curvilinear orbital paths. No such motion has ever been observed or measured, but is only a matter of theory, and indeed a matter of necessity for the globe Earth theory. So in other words, this motion must exist, even though there is no evidence for it. It is purported to exist because it must exist for the theory to hold water. It is this sort of illogical anti-science which has been allowed to be taught in schools as scientific fact, but is nothing more than conjecture built on top of theory founded upon the Copernican principle or the mediocrity principle. Now, the incomprehensible yet elusive and undetectable orbital motion would also be compounded by the alleged spin of the Earth. We are supposedly changing our orientation relative to the Earth's direction of travel through space 180 degrees every 12 hours. So anyone who says that there is no acceleration when it comes to the spinning ball Earth has not really thought this through. That's a massive amount of acceleration constantly. So as the sun rises, the Earth's orbital trajectory would be oriented as if an observer at the equator is standing on the nose of a speeding bullet. Twelve hours later, the same observer would have phased 180 degrees to that path of travel, so uh, as to be standing on the rear of a speeding bullet, 180 degrees opposite of where we started twelve hours earlier. This amounts to a total acceleration of over 130,000 miles per hour during this 12-hour period. Of course, a bullet only goes about 2,500 feet per second, where the ball Earth supposedly travels ridiculously faster than that, a whopping 18.5 miles per second, or 97,680 feet per second, almost 40 times faster than a speeding bullet. Contrary to all this alleged hypothetical motion, the Earth is definitely a fixed frame of reference, which is a big problem for the globe Earth theory, although it is never admitted. Uh, this is something, uh, the, fact, the, the fact that the Earth is a fixed frame of reference is not debated and is agreed by both sides of this discussion. Unfortunately for the ball, you simply cannot consider a spinning ball which travels along multiple curved paths, which are not in alignment to one another, as a fixed frame of reference there should be loads of acceleration built into the spinning ball Earth, and yet it is, in fact, a perfect fixed frame of reference. The only possible fixed frame of reference in all directions, north, south, east, west, up, down, and any combination of these, is an object that is at rest. You cannot have a spinning ball traveling along curved paths behave as a fixed frame of reference for smaller secondary objects attached to it it's not physically possible. So the fact that the world is certainly a fixed frame of reference for objects such as airplanes, this is independent proof that the world is at rest. Anyone with an open mind can confirm such obvious and self-evident facts of nature. 
There are really only two factors which have allowed the ball or theory to survive as long as it has. The first is, of course, the forced indoctrination of every last one of us during our formative years. While the globe earth theory is utterly absurd and fantastically illogical, when we're just children we can easily be convinced of pretty much anything. Many of us remember being incredulous the first time we were told that our clearly flat and stationary world was a spinning ball. Any arguments we might have mustered against the ball earth theory were quickly shut down by some authority figure, be it a parent or a teacher, who was also indoctrinated into the same belief system during their formative years. The deception involved with the ball earth theory is unique in a sense that it is a self-reinforcing doctrine cloaked in the guise of science. Anyone who questions the standard narrative regarding infinite space and the spinning ball earth is instantly ostracized, ridiculed, and deemed either stupid or mad or misled at best. The alienation of anyone so much as questioning the doctrine of earth rotundity prevents most people from even considering what happens to be the truth as a viable hypothesis. The second element of deception is the whopping and intricate lies coming from the world's space agencies, focusing primarily on NASA. The American culture holds a special place for our beloved space agency, and most Americans see NASA as a wholesome, honest, underfunded agency which is only concerned with science and furthering humankind's presence in the solar system. Unfortunately, the veneer of a neutral science space agency only runs skin deep. Under closer scrutiny, it becomes clear that NASA was created specifically to deceive the world. After World War II, there was a vacuum of power left in the wake of the toppled Nazi regime. The technologies being created by the Nazis at the time were far superior to the technologies being used by the Allied forces. It's no surprise then that the United States and Russia couldn't suck up Nazi scientists fast enough. Through covert means, the United States smuggled thousands of Nazi scientists into the United States after the Second World War. Many of the high-profile heads of NASA were indeed high-level Nazis, and were in fact brought into the fold of the U.S. military and space agencies under false pretenses to the American public. The American sentiment against German and Japanese citizens was palpable in the years following the fall of Berlin, so it was necessary for the United States government to secretly infuse the military and space industrial complex with people like Kurt Debus, Eberhard Ries, Arthur Rudolph, and Werner von Braun, Operation Paperclip members who were awarded the NASA Distinguished Service Medal in 1969. Since NASA has been caught essentially red-handed lying about infinite space and faking their missions to other worlds, it becomes clear that by the time such Nazi scientists were being placed into extremely high-level positions at NASA, their primary directive was propaganda well above any sort of science or space exploration. In closing, I recently watched the 2015 documentary called Skyline. It's about the space elevator that was drawn up in plans during the early 2000s. One of the things that caught my attention was the fact that the company or the CEO of the company that was trying to get funding to create the space elevator was pitching the idea to all of the alphabet soup agencies, as he says, and none of the agencies wanted to touch this idea with a 10-foot pole. It's only recently that material called carbon nanotubes was discovered and is being made now. And the core strength of this material is good enough to build a space elevator. The trick is now to make this entire rope as strong as the individual components that make up the rope, which should be feasible, but we haven't quite done that yet. Carbon nanotube is a molecular tube of carbon atoms. If you look at diamond, for example, the carbon atoms are arranged in a cube shape. Carbon nanotubes are the same atoms, they're carbon, but they're arranged on hexagons. If you have the carbon nanotubes, you can make the main cable. Now you've got lots of different paths to solve the other problems.
I knew about the space elevator concept as a thought experiment, something that you run into when you read some science fiction. That gets real neat, but it can't really be built. And I read this article about uh, this guy from Los Alamos, Dr. Bradley Edwards, and he's working on it. And I was just like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, everybody can play with whatever they want. So I clicked through and I read, and you know, yeah, I did figure something pretty fundamental. We figured it out and we reduced it to practice, and from there it's pretty much details, which is what we've been working on. Big details, but still, in the grand scheme of things, details. When you look back from the future, back to this time period, uh, he's going to be one of the most influential people in the whole of human history, given that the space elevator is the step to start a real space age. And there was a single person that made it possible. They should be strutting around with a lot more self-importance than it does. A flashing star marked the location of a synchronous satellite. From the star, two thin lines of light started to extend, one directly down towards the Earth, the other in exactly the opposite direction, out into space. People, instead of saving up to go to Disney World, will now be saving up to go to space. When you get up to a certain point, then you can let go of the tether. And depending on where you let go, you will fall in different directions. If you climb up halfway through the atmosphere, 20 miles or something, let go, you'll fall back down to the ground. If you climb up to what's called geosynchronous orbit, where a lot of communication satellites exist, and you let go, you'll just float there, because that's sort of the balance point. If you let go further away, you'll get thrown away, and, and you can have a free ride to the moon or Mars. developing our paper for NASA. My role was just to be a, a, you know, a business advisor, business consultant. And that's when we filled in a lot of gaps, a lot of details on exactly how you would build a space elevator. I was so excited about this project. And every day, it was a new high. Like, we just kept getting better and better stuff happening. And it was great. It was intoxicating. You know, I never imagined that I would be actively involved in a project like this. Mission Control in Houston lost contact with our space shuttle Columbia. A short time later, debris was seen falling from the skies above Texas. The Columbia is lost. There are no survivors. And we turned our final document in just a few weeks after the Columbia crashed. So, you know, we present this thing, we're very proud of the work that we did, and NASA's really busy. They kind of have other things to worry about, and we were immediately orphaned. That kind of set up the stage for what we had to do next. We formed a company with the best of intentions, and we were, you know, pretty good friends, I think. I went to his wife's birthday party, stuff like that. Barbecue, we had barbecue. And when it came down to dividing the company, Hylip Systems, I got 49% and he got 51%. It's his story, it's his technology, it's his breakthrough. I was quite happy to stand in the background and let him be in the limelight. We're trying to pitch the elevator. Nobody's buying it. We've flown around all over the country talking to people at every alphabet soup organization you can think of. I put up something on the website that if you were able to invest into an elevator to space, how much would you invest? Michael wanted to start a company, sell shares to do the work and toward building a space elevator. Um, and did a couple of things that you can't do when you start a company like that. Now, as a flat earther, it's clear that the reason for this is because, well, 
space doesn't exist, the Earth isn't a spinning ball, and so you cannot build a space elevator uh, around the spinning ball Earth. Now, I don't believe that the people responsible for designing and trying to fund the space elevator were somehow deceiving or deceptive in any way, shape, or form. I believe they 100% believe what they were uh, trying to do was legitimate, just as those responsible for designing and engineering satellites have no idea that they're not actually in orbit around a ball Earth. The mainstream media has recently been trying to snipe the credibility and sanity of flat earthers by releasing several hit piece style documentaries which are presented as being neutral but in reality they are taking underhanded and thinly veiled jabs at the sanity and clarity of the flat earthers i think it's a shame that they are unable to showcase the actual cogent proofs and arguments for flat earth and instead resort to underhanded tactics to try and sully Flat Earther's good name and try to obfuscate the actual proofs and arguments for Flat Earth by presenting straw man arguments which are easily shot down. At the end of the day, the arguments for Flat Earth are very simple and self-evident as mentioned in this um, short video here. The Earth doesn't have curvature, and it is demonstrably not in motion. These are the basic tenets of the Flat Earth Movement, and it's important that we don't lose sight of just how simple and observable and obvious these facts are. It's very easy to get caught up in the drama of Flat Earth, and I just hope that we're able to focus on the science and the evidence and continue making headway when it comes to waking people up about this great deception and the flat earth truth. I want to give a big shout out and thanks to all of my Patreon supporters and of course everyone that has supported the channel uh, with contributions through PayPal and thanks so much to everyone that has uh, given moral support with prayers and your positive comments. It really means a lot to me so God bless and thank you guys. Thanks so much for watching everyone. If you'd like to uh, help support this channel you can become a patron for as little as a buck a month at www.patreon.com slash themorgyle or with a one-time contribution through PayPal to www.paypal.me slash themorgyle. I want to again thank my Patreon supporters. I love you guys. I couldn't do it without you. And thanks so much to everyone that has helped out uh, morally as well as financially with contributions through PayPal. Uh, God bless you guys. And as always, spread the word, spread the world, and peace out, everyone. The Flat Earth Sun and Moon Clock App, a dynamic new app to teach family and friends about where they actually live. The sky is a perfect clock. The sun measures the hours and days. The moon measures the weeks and months. The star constellations measure the seasons and years. 12-12 or 24-hour clock face or go hands-free. The Flat Earth Sun, Moon and Zodiac Clock App with new added features. World Time. See what time it is all around the Flat Earth. A true Earth compass that shows true navigation across and around the Flat Earth plane. Weather. Tap for detailed local weather information. Know what phase and where the moon is at all times. Watch the sun travel between the tropics for the seasons. Select an amazing background. Add your own or have the app change it to a new one automatically every time you use the app. Add a countdown to your next big date. Learn the truth about our world with the featured video of the day. Web button for additional Flat Earth related features, from the mythical curve calculator all the way to Tartaria. While talking to friends, easily pull up pictures that expose the globe lie and shine light on the Flat Earth truth. Video playlists in different languages. See the real trade winds circling the Flat Earth.
and clean screen features. Simply click off the items you don't wish to see. The Flat Earth Sun, Moon, and Zodiac Clock app is the best tool to show your friends and strangers how our Flat Earth actually works.